opened it. We came. It's just a puzzle box! <coughs> Hello, I'm Justin. And I'm Kyle. And we are the Mirror Twins. And we have our Mirror Triplet with us today. I'm Luke Piotrowski. This is Luke Piotrowski, a good friend of ours. We met Luke all the way back in middle school. He really gelled with us. We started making <laughs> movies, our own spoofs. Luke taught me a lot about actually editing. Back in the old VHS days, you know, you'd press play on one and then record on the other. We took up the camcorder to the VCR and then, yeah, edit it that way. What we, we, what we couldn't do in camera. We did a lot of in-camera editing too, I remember. And there was a lot of, you had to wait a second. You'd hit record and on a camcorder, it took a couple seconds to start. Yeah. So I remember editing lots of movies where the first couple words of a line were, were cut out <laughs> were gone. completely. Well, Luke continued his journey with video and movies and now he is a professional <laughs> Hollywood <laughs> Scriptwriter. Whoa. Hollywood screenwriter, baby. That's right. I'm sorry, screenwriter. I shouldn't say screenwriter. That's, That's not term. offensive. Get a load of this. <laughs> <laughs> is there a difference in the term? No. No, it means it's Just one no. is correct and one is Yeah, exactly. Yeah, One's right, highly so. offensive. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you tell us kind of like, what's the overall, what's the big, what do you do? Uh, well, I have a writing partner named Ben Collins, and we write scripts for movies so you know we write the, the dialogue and the action you know you know how we used to do you know but not on notebook paper handwritten <laughs> we use it we use a program we use fade in software screenwriting program and it just does you know helps with the formatting and stuff why do you use that rather than like a word or something like that is, um, is all the formatting's already there the formatting's already there and it auto fills in a lot of things you want to have your your character who's saying the line you know it's all caps and it's centered above their line and you can work really fast because it will start to uh, predictive text too so if you know if i was writing a line for kyle once i type k y l e you know it'll it'll autofill mm. for him and it will sometimes even predict like if i was running a conversation between the two of you it would probably know to to go ahead and put justin for the next one so you can work really fast and word it would take forever to kind of space everything out yeah. but here you can just kind of bloop, bloop, bloop. makes it a little easier gotta keep pace with yeah, right. mine. So, Luke, would you tell us and the good people watching and listening at home what movies have you written scripts for? We have four produced movies. We did, uh, I think the first, it gets a little shady because there was there was a year where we had a bunch kind of go into production and a bunch come out at once. I think our first one to go into production was a movie called Stephanie that was a Blumhouse movie directed by Akiva Goldsman. And then we had a movie called Siren, which was a spin-off of a horror movie, VHS, a found footage horror movie. We did a, a feature adaptation of one of those segments. And then we had a movie called Super Dark Times, which was our first sort of, we really were in control of it. We had a friend that directed it, sort of our first more auteur kind of movie that we had a lot of say in. And then we had a movie called The Night House that just came out last year. Mm -hmm. And we have the new version of Hellraiser, which just wrapped uh, and and should be coming out later this year. So those are the ones that have been made. And then like a ton of stuff that hasn't been made, you know, that, that maybe will, maybe won't. And we'll, we'll get to Hellraiser. Yes, this is the writer or one half of the writers <laughs> for the new Hellraiser movie coming out. Yeah, we know him. Go ahead, <laughs> take a picture. <laughs> This okay. movie's coming out in October, correct? Somewhere this year, I would hope around Halloween time would be nice. They okay. haven't said officially, but... And what platform would... is it coming out It's for? coming out on Hulu. So Hulu. It's, it's a Hulu mm -hmm. uh, original. Yeah. Awesome! With the logo at the bottom. So Clive mm -hmm. Barker's Hellraiser. Mm -hmm. It's in its total reimagining, right? It is. I can't say too much about what it is or how it is, but yeah, it's sort of a... It's yeah. not a sequel, basically. It's, it's, it's not really a sequel, though. It's, okay, it's, yeah. all right. We'll, we'll get back to Hellraiser, but I want to touch on a point that you mentioned, and mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't realize this about people in the film industry, writers being one of them, is that you don't get paid for the scripts that get produced. Sometimes that's not where a majority of your paycheck comes from. Oh, right, yes. It's, you get paid for just doing the work and sometimes those scripts can go very far in production, but then never get made. Yeah, there are there are screenwriters out there who don't, that can make a living as professional screenwriters that have never had a produced credit necessarily. That is crazy. Can you kind of explain how that works? 
works and why it's like that? No. <laughs> I don't think I can. No, I don't understand. The business doesn't make any sense a lot of the time. But, but yeah, I mean, obviously they'll pay you to write a script and then maybe that script isn't good enough. Maybe the star that they thought was going to be in that, you know, falls through and we can't get this financed. Or the big thing that happens to us a lot of time is there's a regime change at the top. Let's say we write something for Paramount and they're, they're paying us to write this script then the head of Paramount, you know, is no longer the head. Somebody else comes in. A lot of times you have people at the top that don't want to inherit other people's projects. So they're like, okay, we're going to wipe the slate clean. Everything that my predecessor was going to do, I don't really want to do that because I didn't choose to do that. And sometimes that can be just like sort of I want to mark my territory. And sometimes it's just like, I don't know what to do with this. This wasn't what I would have chosen to do. We're going in a different direction. So a lot of times you have projects that get killed in that way. You know, but obviously they're not going to make you write for free unless you're like just yeah. just starting out. You know, you can't really do that. So you know they have to pay you to do the writing. But whether you know it costs a lot of money to make a movie, so sometimes it's better for for studios to swallow. They're like, okay, we paid you X amount of money to write the script, but we're not going to throw more money at it and make a movie that we feel like we can't release or isn't going to be good. Paying a screenwriter is depending on the screenwriter. You know that's relatively cheap compared mm. to producing a film, and you got to pay everybody else. So mm -hmm. you can develop movies and you can pay for a lot of scripts, and then you kind of pick the good ones. You know, because you're investing in a potential movie. Because I, I write music and I've gotten mm -hmm. a couple pieces published, but it's commission only. Mm -hmm. It's the company and you. And there's different ways to go through it. You can write a movie on spec where you don't get paid. This is what our movie Stephanie was like. Was Ben and I just wrote that movie, and then we shopped the script around. You know, this is like, you know, you make something, you write a piece of music, you you create a piece of art, and then you see, does anybody want to buy this? Mm -hmm. And a studio might say, yeah, we want to buy that, and then we're gonna make it. And so there's one way to do it. And then another way to do it is like Hellraiser, for example. Now we had a little bit of a, of a, of an in because we had made the night house with the people, David Goyer and Keith Levine, who were producers on the new Hellraiser. So it was like, Oh, we're all buddies. We understand each other. Let's talk about this too. But say we've pitched on all sorts of things. We pitched on Amityville. We pitched on Friday the 13th. We pitched on Halloween. You know, it didn't end up getting these things because we were really nobodies at the time, but it might be like, we want to do a new Halloween what do you got and you can come in and pitch your idea and then it's sort of like a job interview where they can be like okay we like your idea we're going to hire you and it doesn't have to be a pre-existing thing maybe it's a short story you know somebody will hit us up we've got this short story we think it could be a movie what do you guys think we read it and we can sort of get back to them and say here's what we would do okay great we want to hire you to write it so there's different paths to mm -hmm. now to when you're it. making these connections before you had these connections did mm -hmm. you have an agent to help you we had an agent and a manager pretty early on which is i hear sometimes the hardest thing to get um but luckily my, my writing partner went to film school so he had some connections of people mm -hmm. that were in the industry in different ways that once we had scripts it was like oh could you take a look at this and do you know anybody and you know we had a you know, our agent was sort of up and coming at the time as well. And, you know, this is kind of the big thing. The thing is, is it's not always knowing the head of the studio, right? It's just knowing other people who are also ascendant at the same time. And so you can help them out. They can help you out. Oh, I know somebody. So it was really just a passing the script along to a potential agent who read it and liked it, got in touch and, mm -hmm. you know. It was sort of a probationary period of like, right. okay, we'll be your agent. I'm not going to sign anything, but like, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of feel this out. And then uh, he's, we've only had the same agent for, gosh, like 10 years or something now. Okay. That's well, awesome. When did you start seriously writing? Because you were an English teacher. I was an English teacher for mm -hmm. nine years. And you were writing at the same time, right? And like, yeah. some scripts were I started being... seriously writing when we would make videos for the morning <laughs> announcements at... In middle school. Flat Rock. It was it Flat Rock Middle School. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was, that was the serious writing. I was trying to go to film school to the Savannah College of Art and Design, uh, and I couldn't network because I didn't have any friends there. Um, so it was easy to make movies when we were all friends, but it becomes a lot harder when you're at a school by yourself and you don't know anybody, particularly for me. So I ended up not doing that and studying English and becoming a, an English teacher. I wrote short stories and like novels and things in the meantime just to try and be creative, but, but it was my writing partner who ended up graduating after me he's, he's a little bit younger than me and he went to LA and he and I started writing things together after he had graduated so that was about 2008 what do they call it when it's it's like 
promise money like we'll pay you not to show this to anyone else uh or, an option it, an option yeah they'll okay. do like an option so yeah. that's another way script writers can make money so they pay you to write it but they can also pay oh i like this let me talk to some big wigs and i'll give you option money i guess right well yeah the the studio will, will option the script which means don't take it out to anybody else with some of our early movies we had free options you know it's like yeah. don't show it to anybody else handshake deal you know, <laughs> yeah, like, wink we're, wink no, we're, no. we're gonna see if we can do something with this but stop stop showing other people the, the really the big thing that you, you make a lot of money on and we're just sort of now starting to experience any of this is on residuals which is you know the more the movie shows up on you know night house is on hbo max right now and so it's like you see a little bit of money when it's you know rentals come in you know mm -hmm. all the people that see it in the theater you get a little bit of residuals for writing that thing and you get a little bit of residual that's what a lot of like writer strikes and stuff you remember the big writer strike mm -hmm. that happened when we were gosh it was a while ago now but 2009 yeah i think so right. yeah it was was you know when you're going from the internet you know where everything's streaming Whereas before, you get residuals every time your movie plays on television or your episode airs. But that changes when it's on stream a streaming anytime. platform. <laughs> right. And so, you know, we want to make sure that, that the deals are reflect how, how do people actually consume media right. and make sure that everybody who participated in the creation of that media is continuing to be compensated because it continues to make money, yeah, you know, right. whether that's through ticket sales or through dvd or blu-ray purchases or streaming rentals or ending on a streaming platform you sort of you know depending on how good your deal is you get a little bit of you can see some of that so the genre that you primarily write in is horror or so that i mean that's movies. it's straight horror um but when we knew you when we were doing stuff together it was all comedy that's true but sometimes both Mm -hmm. I think I think a lot of our stuff always had a little bit of both of that that Evil Dead kind of flavor of like really wacky silly slapstick horror elements and scary creatures and monsters. And I tell people, oh, I know a professional uh, sc screenwriter, <laughs> screenwriter, uh, who's actually writes, writer. It's a screenwriter. screenwriter. There you I like that. that. And they ask me, oh, what has he written? And I tell them. <laughs> Some <laughs> indie junk. <-o. laughs> I say, he writes really episode. smart horror movies. That's how I kind of describe That's your style. Kind of you, sure. Is that correct? Is that how you describe yourself? I think so. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get into this whole thing. There's like a, there's a thing within me horror community online and, and within like horror journalism and, and film criticism in general of the term of elevated horror. I don't know if you've heard the term elevated mm. horror. They sort of use it to describe honestly a better term would maybe be art house horror mm -hmm. um, because everybody really gets rankled at the idea of, of elevated horror because they feel that it implies that other horror is, is less than but you think oh. like a movie like The Witch or The Babadook or you know maybe even to some extent It Follows or like the A24 horror movies they're movies that, you know, obviously you have your, like, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4 is not an elevated <laughs> horror movie, right? It's, <laughs> it's there to be... It's awesome, but it's there to, you know... Purely entertain. Yeah. There are movies that are made to purely entertain. There are movies that sort of, like, have more artistic intention or tone. And I don't feel that there's a problem in kind of, you know, differentiating just in conversation the way you would talk about different genres of music you know mm -hmm. I know that a lot of times people that are labeled a certain genre of music might bristle at that label of like I remember mm -hmm. when alternative music came out when we were sort of growing up it was there were a lot of artists like I I don't want that label but it's like well but this is convenient when we're having a conversation yeah. about yeah. how it's different so you know we just want to make movies that are good and mm -hmm. we like horror look I like Evil Dead <laughs> Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 3 was one of my favorite horror movies of all time. You know, Fright Night. We like sort of schlocky things or crazy things. Toxic Avenger. You know, like, <laughs> I'll watch that stuff. And I love that stuff. And I studied English literature. So I have sort of like a snooty background. But I have a love for all sorts of culture. And I want to make, you know comic book things and horror movie things that you know are also as good as i can possibly make them so i mean if that's just a byproduct of that you know we also i want people to like it and i want yeah. to make popular stuff as well i try to make it try to make it smart and, and try to put a little bit of myself into it i'm not i'm not in it to make money it, you know I, I i need to make money so that i can continue to do it but that's at the end of the day you don't want to make something that matters to you i remember when you made that decision because you were living yeah not uh, far from here 
you you were writing scripts. You were making some money through your connections in California, uh-huh. and but still teaching during the day. It's like a superhero. <laughs> By day, he's a common English teacher. By night, he's a amazing and script. No sometimes, English teacher. Is sometimes common. by planning period. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes by planning. <laughs> there was that time where you made the decision. Okay, I I can actually support myself. Yeah, I'm that, that move. was it. Was sort of a tiered thing of like, okay, I'm gonna do this almost on a whim and for fun and like we'll see to like oh this is getting a little bit more serious and then the first goal was like can i quit teaching can yeah. i ever get to the point where i can quit teaching and then that was a big deal and that was a big risk of like i remember going in and sitting down with my principal of like i'm gonna try and do this and, <laughs> you know and she was nice enough to be like well okay if it doesn't work out you know let us know, <laughs> you know? it did lady it did. <laughs> it did there's a principal in the night house and i based her dialogue and pat like patterns of speech on my principal and was like i'm gonna write something that sounds like what she would say <laughs> Um, so she's got it's a, flattering, she's right? got a spiritual cameo yeah, yeah in the movie so that was the first big step was yeah can I quit teaching and then obviously the next thing was well when can I feel financially stable enough to move to California where everything is we were talking about earlier everything is much more expensive yeah. that worked out and I've been out there six years seven six years, years something like that and excellent and, and just receiving more jobs and getting more acclaim and that's amazing yeah it's been a good year there's a lot of uh, exciting stuff maybe on the horizon that I oh, that he can talk not about. talk let, about let me that's ask you about so... time frame so yeah. let's say you either have an idea for a script or somebody came to you with an idea mm-hmm. and everything goes smoothly or the average amount of time it doesn't okay, <laughs> it, it, never does. Does. it never does it never does in let's a say, perfect world <laughs> let's say it's the average everything is the average the average amount of work the average amount of time the average amount of meetings that you have to take. Mm. How long does it take? Because I know that you have a million meetings, right? For everything. Lots of meetings, yeah. Idea to it's out. Everybody can watch it. Yeah. How long does that take? Average. I, I mean, I, I don't know about average, but I will say it does seem, because I have such a hard answer here, is, is it does seem like we're on a five-year cycle. Five years. Whereas Night House we wrote very early on because we were frustrated by some of the studio experience of you know having to go through that process of you got to have so many jump scares by page 10 and like you know trying to be really commercial it's that specific sometimes really you know, like, i mean in the age of algorithms and stuff and you know certainly some studios that sort of make their money on like a very specific brand of horror movie will be like does this track as being popular compared to our other movies they yeah. l- literally use algorithms and like a step by step guide to write some of these i mean it comes up. We don't. Wow. We don't. Ha- we, nobody gives us a list and makes us do that. But you do. The executives sort of understand. You know, look, look. There are creatives, and then there are the money people, and then there's people in between. You know, and so you'll have some producers that are very creative. You'll have some producers that are very money driven. Mm-hmm. You know, and then some producers that are. You know, the best ones are the ones that are like pragmatic enough and smart enough to be like, look, I understand what you're trying to do artistically. Let me tell you what we need to do to make it happen, you know, and make sure that it makes money because otherwise I can't help you do that. And so right. they under, they can speak both languages, yeah. basically. And those those are the best kind because they'll just be honest with you. Like, look, we're not going to be able to sell this unless we attach this kind of star because mm. nobody will pay for it. It's not like they're giving us this checklist that we have okay. to do, but they'll look at our script and say, your first, you know, 30 pages... You know, the notes, they give notes, and the notes yeah. will usually be dictated by that kind of information, okay. that kind of, you know, understanding of it. Of like, well, How often this. are those higher-ups correct? Because I know, <laughs> famously, I can't remember his name, the producer, Back to the Future, didn't want to call it Back to the Future because he thought the title was too confusing. Huh. And Steven Spielberg sent him a message. That, have you heard this story? Yeah. Where he said, ah, oh, that's a funny joke. <laughs> and, uh, that's the guy got too embarrassed it. to say anything about it. And so, like, oh, okay, I guess it's Back to the Future. He wanted to call it Man from Mars or something. Yeah, like it was some oh, ridiculous Some title. ridiculous Oh, title. I do remember hearing about that. Yeah. So, so, back to my question, how often are they right? Like, when they're like, oh, well, like you said, well, we can't, we have to get this type of actor, otherwise it won't make money, blah, blah, blah. How often well, are they that, correct? That's, you, that's you, frustrating, the actor thing, because you, you don't really, you can never really tell. Who knows if they were right or wrong? Would yeah. this movie have been a success with that? I mean, a lot of that has to do with, like, how it does internationally, mm-hmm. and, and and we can only get people to give us money if you have this kind of person in it. Um, so I guess they're right, because you get that person, you know. So that right. one's harder to tell. Mm-hmm. On creative notes, it, it can be frustrating when you've been writing the thing for like years, and you know the story inside and out, and somebody comes in and they're reading it once, maybe 
you know, as a stack of scripts and they're telling you this doesn't make sense. And you're like, well, believe me, it makes sense. You read it once when you were tired after you'd read three other scripts. Mm -hmm. That's why it doesn't make sense to you. If you read it again, you know, sometimes, sometimes it sort of feels like you can give them a script twice with minimal changes. And they're like, oh my God, it's so much better. <laughs> like, yeah, because you read it again and you now knew what you were looking for. Yeah, okay. I, I will say a lot of times it does come down to the, it's the note behind the note that you need to to think about. It's like they're, they're telling you something. They might make a suggestion. Their suggestion might be wrong. But the fact that they noticed something okay. was right. And so what you need to do is understand you have a problem with something in the story where you, it didn't make sense to you. Okay. You didn't think it was good. What I need to do is understand why you had that reaction. See yeah. if I can fix it on my terms because uh, I am the ex. You know, I know all this stuff. So how can I? Yeah. How can how can so I? So that address is a, it. That's another really good uh, writing tidbit. Right. There. You don't always have to literally make that change. It's more. Read between the lines. Play psychologist. Mm -hmm. Why did this person exactly. make this note? And then, oh, you know, they probably didn't understand this part. And that's probably back here. I need to change this stuff mm -hmm. beforehand. That's interesting. Pro tip number two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they're not wrong. It's just... They don't know how to articulate it. Right. And how can you... That's part of your job is understanding, you know, that you talk about psychology is like kind of understanding that aspect of it and then being able to basically translate whatever their issue was into your own language. And don't take it. the notes literally. Right. Not always. Not always. Not always. Not always. Not always. Yeah. Okay. Get out of my house. You should probably take that literally. <laughs> Does he want me to leave or should I brought Make a burritos? <laughs> a friend of mine who did stunts in a lot of local stuff, mm -hmm. he kept getting these jobs for horror movies. And I asked mm -hmm. him one time, why is it always horror movies? And he turned to me and said, there's always a market for horror movies, mm -hmm. no matter how good or bad they are. They're <laughs> easier to sell. Is that true? What is your opinion on that? Yeah, I, I think horror movies are cheaper to make, but stand to make a lot of money. So, you know, you don't necessarily need a big star for a horror movie in the same way you do for a high concept science fiction movie or a romantic comedy, right? You go to see a romantic comedy because of who's in it, nine times out of ten. Whereas a horror movie, it doesn't, it can be Ethan Hawke, it can be somebody you've never heard of before. And people still see it. Yeah, you're going to see whatever the gimmick is. So, you know, like a movie like Lights Out, you know, it's like, oh, it's got a good hook, it's got a good gimmick, we'll go see that. You know, teenagers go to the movies on a Friday night and what are they going to go see? Well, let's go see a scary movie. So it's it's a very reliable genre in that way and it's not like a superhero movie super expensive so if it doesn't do too well I don't know. And certainly in the era of like Blumhouse where they started making them like super duper cheap you could sort of take a gamble you know and you make five of them for relatively cheap and if one of them hits big well okay it paid for yeah. all of them and then some you're right why do you and your writing partner why are you guys attracted to horror i don't know i just think i always liked monsters and scary things and that was you know how we bonded pretty early on you know and i and, and i think similar to why horror is uh, a marketable genre is because I didn't think I was going to be writing, you know, $200 million movies. I never expected that. That wasn't my plan, and you still haven't yet. Um, but but I, did, I didn't want to write, like, straight indie dramas. You know, I wanted to have genre to it. You know, it's, to me, you know, not, The Nighthouse is a movie about grief, and I don't think it's as interesting to write or to watch a movie that's just about grief. It's just about a woman whose husband died. I want to make it more universal by using metaphor and genre elements. And so it can be really entertaining. And I feel it's more relatable if it's not one-to-one. -one. You know, a movie about an alcoholic, okay, that's interesting. But a movie about a guy who's addicted to having ghosts walk through him, you know, it's still talking about addiction, but yeah. it has a more interesting and different hook. And then whatever your addiction is that story could be speaking to that, whether yeah. it's alcohol or whether it's drugs, or whether it's gambling or whatever else, you sort of able to speak in more universal terms in your talk when you're using genre to do it and then it's just more fun you know it's the, yeah. it's the spoonful of sugar that helps the medicine go down mm -hmm. you know i'm only interested in you know the fiction not recreating reality necessarily yeah. i totally agree with that i'm very much a monster <laughs> fan too yeah. uh, if anyone's seen my work on the atlanta brick co channel you know i always go after the halloween sets and mm -hmm. minifigures and stuff i love that stuff i think that's part of why we became friends yeah. was was an interest in those kinds of you know, yeah. monsters. i think yeah. i'm shocking to you was it 
were you in my home at class? And we were talking about like the aliens, like the the you know the, <laughs> the muffins xenomorph. they make. <laughs> Do you remember that? they put too much oil in it or yes. something? And the so muffins the top when they cooked it. It looked like the eggs from aliens. I forgot all about that. You were you were drawing them. You were drawing the aliens from Alien. No one so, ate those muffins. So I, had, oh, I was gonna say <laughs> no one <had> taste. <laughs> Do you have a specific writing process? Or is it different per project? We've changed over the over the years as we've gotten more experience. We didn't used to outline, you know, I was doing that Stephen King method of just like, well, I want to see where the story goes, so I don't want to know the ending until I get there, which is not, if you're writing professionally, you can't really do that. Like, they start to, you know, you need to, especially if you're pitching something, you need to have beginning, middle, and end. Mm -hmm. And you need to tell them, here's a beginning, middle, and end, so that they know, okay, I know what this is, now I'll pay you to write it. And that can be frustrating because it's all the hard work with none of the fun stuff. The mm. fun stuff is writing scenes with characters and they're doing stuff and you're like getting to do like the hard part is the math equation of a plot, you know, and like how do we set things up and pay it off and that you have to do all that without getting any of the fun is like that can be. That was kind of sort of the hardest thing to learn yeah. about writing professionally was, you know, I got to tell you the story before I tell the story to myself in a way. Yeah. yeah. Do you, does that ever conflict? So you made this plan, you sold it on this plan, and then when you actually have those two characters sit down in that room <laughs> in your head, it starts going somewhere else and you're thinking, this is so much better. I got to change the ending now. Has that ever happened? Yeah, a little bit. I, th I think you sort of are free to do that. And then, you know, at the, it's you're not a novelist by yourself. Like, here it is. I'm done. It's, okay, here it is. Let me show the producers. Let me get a free producer's pass here. Like, before we show it to the execs at the studio, like, the producer's going to get a little pass. Like, here are my notes. Okay, okay. we'll do your notes. Sometimes we get, we've gotten stuck on projects that have stalled out and died because producers just kept on like, well, let's, I don't know, let's keep trying, let's keep trying. And there were so many producers that it just, okay, well, I guess this isn't happening because there's too many cooks in the kitchen. But ideally, you know, you're working like, you know, say Hellraiser, you know, we had a story by David Goyer, who is the producer on there, and he, he wrote uh, Blade and Dark City, um, super big, you know, screenwriter from when we were, you know, yeah. in high school, like, going to see movies. It was like, he was writing a lot of the movies that we were going to see, you know, Batman Begins. He did a, you know, a, a sort of a, a treatment of the new Hellraiser story, and then we, you know, took that and changed a lot of that and you know built out from there mm -hmm. and then we had our director from the night house eventually come on he came on and there was a lot of sort of grief elements to the hellraiser initially and we were like well we just did that so we need to kind of change it up and take this in a different direction you know just as a director in general he's going to have some ideas of like i like this i don't like that and so you're 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 not going to end up with the same thing anyway mm -hmm. so it's always changing from other people and it might change from you too as you get in the story and realize okay this is better you could probably explain to them look i know we said this but this is going to be better yeah there's so much better. you're going to be able to usually convince them if it's like yeah so i wanted to ask you where you thought the art horror genre was going elevated horror i mean horror in general chases trends and that's sort of the problem is you have something come out and it changes you know we had saw come out and then you had the you know the torture porn genre because uh, this was popular so there's a lot of movies that are like that and then you had paranormal activity come out so that's when we arrived on the scene was everything was found footage and we actually had a meeting with somebody once that says we're looking for the next paranormal activity and and my writing partner said to them like you you know you know the next one's gonna look you know it's not gonna look like paranormal activity the next paranormal activity is not gonna look like that it's mm -hmm. not gonna be another found footage horror movie it's going to be something that's completely different and i think he asked him, like if paranormal activity came across your desk today and you'd never seen it before would you do it and he's like no <laughs> yeah. and so that's the problem is you have to be thinking ahead but sometimes we're we're too far ahead like we i told you we're on this five-year cycle mm -hmm. so we wrote night house before there was Hereditary, before there was Get Out, before there was The Witch, there weren't, the art house horror boom hadn't really happened, so there wasn't a market for it. So Night House is like, well, this isn't a Blumhouse movie. This doesn't look like Insidious. So how can we sell that? You know, we don't understand what this is. And mm -hmm. then you cut to five years later, and it's like, okay, well, there it is. So it's hard because sometimes you're too soon, mm -hmm. and then you have to wait. And then, you know, sometimes you're you're chasing trends and you're behind the times. So it's it's kind of hard to say, especially with streaming, there's so many more options and there's so many interesting things happening with like, you know, TV and stuff too and limited series that it's not, there's some really good and creepy stuff that's happening and it's not even in the horror genre, it's, you know, 
stuff like Severance on Apple TV is like mm-hmm. super creepy. It's not horror. Mm-hmm. And it's not a movie, but it kind of pushes all those buttons too. Yeah. So. Do you feel like you can point to specific influences? Either you've named some movies already, mm-hmm. but are there any books or anything else that uh, authors in terms of like the genre in general influencing your writing or, or me influence? personally? Yeah, you personally. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a big Stephen King guy, and that's you know that's always in there. Um, ben and I are both big fans of Japanese cinema, so like you know Junji Ito and like horror manga and mm-hmm. and anime and stuff. And J horror works its way into our stuff. When you talk about you know trying to make it smart or trying to be unique, is not just pulling from horror, but doing you know other you know pulling from from non-genre things and combining that with horror. So it's like, what's the horror version of this look like? How do you combine The Shining with Ordinary People? Or, yeah. you know, something else. Even 12 Angry Men meets, you know, yeah. something. That's what keeps the genre fresh. Because if mm-hmm. you're just, if you're just, like, my favorite movie is Halloween 3, and I just want to make movies like Halloween 3. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, but then they've already made Halloween 3. So yeah. what you need to do is... About why four do you, times why, now. <laughs> right, why do you like that movie? And then why do you like this other movie? And then why do you like this book and like this kind of music? Yeah. You know, I don't I don't listen to scary music when I write. I listen to sad music when I write because I want it to be an emotionally, you know, charged experience. I'm not listening to like metal and like creepy stuff most yeah. of the time. Okay, um, so you say to... Alexa, make me sad. <laughs> play, play that. We have Gloomy Alexa. Time playlist. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> Alexa, that's enough. You have to be nice to our robot masters. I always say thank you. Yeah, be you. careful. I would say, if I was in your position, I would be, like, doing a man squeal on the inside when I got the job to work on a property that I had been a fan on. Yeah. Talking about, of course, Hellraiser. Mm-hmm. I know we can't talk too much about it. He's <laughs> As the recording of this video, there has not been a trailer or teaser or anything. There's just been pictures and announcements, right? Not even pictures. Okay. Just announcements. What can we talk about? We... Like the actress? Yeah. Jamie Clayton is playing Pinhead. Okay. So we have a female Pinhead, mm-hmm. which leads people to believe, okay, this is a reimagining. Or if it is a sequel, then there's been some passing of the torch within the mm-hmm. Cenobite. Uh, hierarchy <laughs> or whatever we can speculate yeah. all day look he don't don't look at his face he might give something away no it, it, yeah. it's its own movie it's its own story it's okay. its own new so Cinebites. I mean was that huge for you to yeah. be able to like oh this movie I grew up that influenced me now I get to write for it yeah that's the that's the that's the dream and that's one of the that was one of the big ones I think that, that Ben and I both wanted to do and so what what happened was David Goyer and his company they had the rights to Hellraiser and it was announced in the trades and you're like oh well we're working with David Goyer and so I remember on the set of Nighthouse cornering our producer Keith and sort of saying like so what's up with Hellraiser what do you guys do you guys need any writers at the time we, we thought Goyer was going to be writing it himself but he ended up just writing kind of the treatment you know eventually when it came time they did ask us because we expressed so much interest and, and it all happened pretty quick but it was very surreal and a really a dream come true but it, we were kind of like begging <laughs> for the job <laughs> So uh, there's a, some kind of like a trade magazine or something or some trade website where you can yeah, find that information. Deadline out. or Hollywood Reporter or something. Okay. Yeah, if you follow them on on Twitter or online, like yeah, they always have the announcements of. Oh, um, so hey, it's you know, Spyglass has the rights to Hellraiser. David Goyer working on this. You know. Okay, so that's it. Behooves you to follow that stuff. Yeah. Big time. Yeah. I guess we can't talk about Hellraiser. So, <laughs> um, well, then I'll just go on. I'll, is there another property where you would just man squeal? If... Nightmare on Elm Street. Nightmare on Elm Street. That would be your one. Yeah. Not under this siege. is why we get along. Not, not under siege. Not under siege. <laughs> or or a Stephen, get out of here. A, a Stephen King adaptation would be big. But but in okay. terms of like the horror franchises, you know, Elm Street was always my favorite growing up, and I, I think because it mixed genres, because there was elements of dark fantasy and adventure. You know, if you're watching Stranger Things season four, it's like, oh my god, it's Elm Street sequel. Yeah. You know, not Elm Street one even like Elm Street sequel. Yeah. It's like. All characters banding together to like fight evil you yeah. know and and it manifests in these very specific ways so it's very inventive and imaginative you know for my money that you know the worst nightmare on elm street movie still has like visuals that are impressive today and mm-hmm. like surreal and like worth watching you know it's not it's they're never boring they're yeah. always so inventive uh, that was our introduction our sister <laughs> was oh, into yeah. those movies and mm-hmm. so nightmare on elm street was our introduction into 
horror. <laughs> Probably too young to watch. Always those. too young. Yeah, that was a big one for me. My friend's sister in her room, she had like VHS tapes of horror movies she'd record it either dubbed off of other vhs tapes via the connecting to vcr's method or taped off hbo or whatever and i remember we'd always sneak into her room and take you know and then and as a nightmare on elm street 3 was one of the ones that i saw i mean all, i'd always loved monsters gremlins and ghostbusters were like that was godzilla that mm-hmm. was the stuff i was into as a kid but you know in terms of horror movies like our horror movies that was a pretty early one for me too so do you have a favorite horror movie now i mean one that you didn't write (laughs) yeah i mean the exorcist probably because it does that thing that we're you know that kind of elevated thing right Mm -hmm. you know and and it's interesting that you know i was on a podcast recently and we're talking about the elevated horror thing and it was like yeah exorcist is elevated horror in a lot of the ways that elevated horror is but it's also kind of an exploitation movie yeah (laughs) there's so there's a lot of gruesome stuff and a lot of shocking stuff that's there to be shocking Mm -hmm. uh and then but also a lot of special effects but it's super character driven you know it's about something right and it's metaphorically about there's something wrong with my child my child is ill nobody can help me and i don't know what's Mm -hmm. wrong with them and so it's playing in these very real fears and it's about a crisis of faith so it's got all this highfalutin stuff Mm -hmm. and it's got this really horror movie shock stuff and it there's no real distinction made you know they they both work really well so that's that's a favorite i love the original candy man i love um this french movie called martyrs nightmare on elm street 3 those are you know sort of in my my top five so <laughs> when when you watch shining. movies now or when you started becoming a professional writer do you watch them differently like more analytically yeah yeah, it becomes hard. I had it, you know, we, we did theater, you know, all of us to varying degrees in, in high school, like high school theater. You go to the theater competitions, and I always had a hard time going to the competitions because of we watching other high school students do theater. As a high school student, was just like, I just want to get up there and do it. Like, yeah. I don't want to watch it. I want to go do it. Yeah. And, and so there are certain movies and like, you know, especially horror movies, it's like, oh, I just want to write something like this. Or like, oh, I wish I had written this. Or, you know, you kind of do have that so once okay. you've made the sausage it does become slightly harder to check out and there's also a mm. feeling of responsibility of like gosh i need to i need to be seeing all this i need to be getting in different influences and i need to be seeing what's going on so this do you have a writing pet peeve is there movies or genres of movies where mm. I, why is this popular this is bad what's do you have a couple you want to name for us i, I don't like twists that are not done well so i won't like name any names or anything but you know there's certainly movies like i think the sixth sense is a good twist right because the the reveal is shocking that's spoilers for the sixth sense <laughs> you How haven't years? seen it we didn't actually say what the twist was. I, I won't say what it is but there's <laughs> a twist in the, there's this movie called the sixth sense <laughs> Uh, it was kind of popular. It was a, kind of a big deal at the time. I, don't, I think that's a twist that's additive, right? Because you get to the end and then you look back at everything that came before and it's like, oh, okay. It makes it more, you know, yeah. his dinner scene with his wife is like, this is more emotional. This is more worthwhile. It, it opens it up. Uh, what I don't like is twists. Look, uh, okay, I will name names. We'll, we'll pick on Shyamalan because he said that his, you know, the, the sixth sense is so good. That twist works for me. The twist in the village doesn't work for me because it makes the movie less interesting and less scary because you've taken something away from me yeah so a twist that that kind of lie to you you know i think a surprise is good but when it feels like it was a lie like i was cheated out of something that i was connecting with in the story that have now proven to me to be false i get really frustrated with that yeah. i don't have a whole lot of patience for that so i, I again I, I want it to be unpredictable but a twist that changes something in a cool way Right. It just needs okay. to be additive. You yeah. know, and I think a lot of times people are so concerned with a twist and protecting the twist and protecting surprises that sometimes you get to it and it's like, well, this wasn't set up at all. Like, this yeah. is not... Yeah. It was there just to be there. Yeah, it was just there. And there was no way I could have guessed. It doesn't narratively... It doesn't organically fit. It, and, and you could have been dropping hints and made it feel like this was inevitable. But instead, to maintain surprise, you've just yeah. made it not really make sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to say that it has to make sense. Yeah, it's got to make sense. And it's got to be, it's got to, once you get there, it needs to feel like, of course, it couldn't have ended any other way. Mm -hmm. And not like, huh? Yeah. And I think a lot of times the internet likes to, they almost treat it like a game where it's like, I want to beat the movie. Yeah. I'm going to outsmart the movie. I'm going to spot the plot holes. I'm going to solve the puzzle. I'm going to find the clues. And it's like, it's a, it's a poem. Like you interpret it. It's not a riddle that you solve and there's one answer Mm -hmm. and that your, you know, YouTube video is going to like crack it wide open. I got, I solved it. You can't solve it. You know, you don't, it's not a math equation. You're not supposed to. Right. You're supposed to interpret it. Yeah. 
and then somebody else is supposed to interpret it and they have their own interpretation mm-hmm. you know and so there's a weird mentality about some of the stuff and like stuff that plays too hard into that that's a trope i don't like i think of the disney movies that have the twist villain that's come under fire where uh, a lot of the critics oh, another twist villain mm-hmm. another surprise villain it's there's no like decent Disney villains like they had in the old day. You know, right, back classic when I was villain. Up. Uh-huh. <laughs> but uh, the the surprise villain, I think, longtime Disney fans are rolling their eyes at because it's just every Disney cartoon now has the surprise villain. And I it's can just, see that. It's getting tiresome because we kind of miss our Ursulas or um, Doctor Faciliers and stuff <laughs> like that. Which I think people say he was the last real Disney villain. Media industry or movie industry has come under fire a little bit having social or political commentary over story that Mm -hmm. that's becoming more prevalent or more noticed now Mm -hmm. than it had been i personally like social commentary when it's woven in so well that it's an afterthought it's like oh i didn't realize they were saying that about oh okay that kind of but when it kind of hits you in the forefront it's it kind of ruins the story it's like you're putting your social commentary or political commentary ahead of story Uh rather than the other way around have you noticed that is that an issue have you ever run into that do they do producers tell you well we need to have this in the story has that ever happened you get a question of like why why tell this story now you know what's what's okay. relevant about it. Stephen King talks about how he, he'll sort of write the story once without thinking about theme, and then kind of look back and realize what it was he was writing about, and then do a second pass that plays more into that theme, mm. which I think is a, a fairly smart way to go. I do think you could do it sort of concurrently. Of like, I know I want to talk about this stuff, and like, what's a story that can kind of feel like it's touching on these things. I don't know that, you know, it's it's probably never a good idea, whatever your theme is, whether it's social commentary or not, to be like starting completely with theme and then building around that. But that but that can work too. Obviously, mm-hmm. it just needs to work as a story. And so similar with a twist, I think it just needs to work. Nobody wants to be preached to. You know, you want to be telling a story. You know, in terms of social stuff, I think the biggest thing we need is just like, we need to allow lots of other people to tell stories and we need to free people up to tell stories that aren't necessarily about their experience as you know a minority of some way like let gay people write movies about straight people (laughs) let them write horror movies that don't have to comment on that you know let asian people make movies where they don't have to be representing all of you know asian americans in their story let them tell whatever story they want to tell and invite more people to the party to make their art and then you will naturally have that stuff happening and i like you know social commentary i want you know my horror movies certainly have always talked about something from Mm -hmm. dawn of the dead onwards you know you're always talking about something yeah you know you're you are always commenting on society because horror is about what's scary and so we Mm -hmm. look at what's scary and like let's what's the nightmare version of that what are the fears that the movie can can convey um but but obviously I don't think anything that is not about the story and the characters, but it doesn't feel like it's a natural fit. If it feels like it's forced, of course, it's never going to yeah. be good. Well, not oh, Night of the Living Dead, okay. the fact that you have, you know, the black guy survives and, you know, spoilers for Night of the Living Dead <laughs> and, and, and comes out of the building at the end and he's, he survived the whole night. He survived the zombie apocalypse and he steps out and he gets shot by the cops. Yeah. That's in the black and white yeah the original night of the living dead yeah. you know like that's very political that's yeah. very much commentary and you know it's not what the story is all about but it's very much in there and yeah. people distrusting each other and that that you know that guy trying to stand up and and lead and save everybody and is ultimately you know yeah. victimized by the people but, but, but the, theme, to save. the theme was interwoven and the story came first i felt like let's tell a good story first the, we, we have this theme interwoven into it but I don't know. I just that is a perfect example of what I call like sure. a good way sure. to add in social commentary. But different people need different things, and different people have different tastes. And so I definitely feel like it's especially this time our responsibility as viewers and creators to not feel threatened by anybody that does want to make a political, you know, a social commentary statement. You know, and it may not be for you. It's like, oh, I didn't like that one but sometimes we don't like it because we're not comfortable with what it's saying yeah it's, it's, <laughs> it's opposite it, it may not believe. be the story and i think you know, certainly online you get a lot of people that will attack things and they'll say it's bad storytelling but really it's because the story has kind of revealed something about their biases that they are uncomfortable with and so it's like it's as bad you know, certainly you look at star wars fandom and you get a lot of you know legitimate critiques and you get a lot of critiques that are actually charged by something that is, I feel, a very negative <laughs> space and a very, uh, 
insecure space. But you've never been asked, hey, you need to put in this or like you've never had that experience personally. No, no. I mean, right. the, just conversations about why is it relevant and, and but then and stuff that we bring to the table of like, well, we want to talk about this. Yeah. You know, we, we want to talk about this. There's some projects we're working on right now that are that are, you know, pretty, you know, making some pretty strong social commentary and really playing with that stuff and what I think could be a really fun way. Yeah. Um, but it's it's not like a mandate. The, the jump scares are a mandate. You know, yeah. the social commentary is you're you're a storyteller. What are you talking about? Yeah. And I think any artist needs to be able to think about that. What yeah. is this? How does this relate to the world that we live in? Yeah. Especially with horror. Well, thank you, Luke, so much for uh, coming over to my house and talking with us. I'm just happy to film stuff with you two again. Yeah. Remember seventh grade filming yeah. filming our our movie on, and so this is taking me back we're, we're, we're gonna have to make a sequel to one of our first movies <laughs> uh, monkeys yes that's what it was called but a, a quick anecdote i remember because i was just thinking about it the other day was in i guess it was seventh grade maybe it was eighth grade we were at the middle school we were waiting for your mom to come pick us up and we had we did the morning announcements which they aired around the whole school so we would do movie parodies and we were supposed to be reading the announcements and letting students know what was going on at the school but really we were just doing movie parodies and then sneaking in these yeah. like Sometimes subliminal it announcements. wasn't sneaking like by the way before I do yeah. don't forget to meet in the cafeteria <laughs> for the 4-H club <laughs> but I remember some some kid came up to us and I've told this story before so I don't mean to embarrass you Kyle but this kid came up to us and was like hey you're, you're those weird guys and Kyle without missing a beat took off his backpack and threw it on the ground and went we're not weird <laughs> Freak that kid out. Just Best answer you can give. <laughs> Just gotta lean into it. Just own it. Well, I love it. Luke is visiting uh, from California, so he was nice enough to come by and give us a yeah. couple hours of his time. Oh, for you this didn't video. fly here for this? <laughs> Don't forget to like this... and subscribe, baby. That's right, like and subscribe. Actually, that's a perfect segue. Why don't you plug yourself, sir? We know. We have a Hellraiser, new, brand new Hellraiser brand movie new Hellraiser. coming out, uh, maybe around October. We haven't had Wait any announcements this year. yet. That's all I know for sure. Okay. And it's Hulu. going to be on Hulu. Yep. And look for Luke's other movies, which are? Uh, Super Dark Times is on Hulu, um, and Shudder, and Tubi, I think. That's a good one. Um, I'm not sure if... Stephanie and Siren are playing. Siren might still be on Netflix. Uh, and, and The Night House just is up on HBO Max and, you know, on Blu-ray. Uh, and I think you can still rent it other places as well if you uh, on streaming if you don't have HBO Max. I think it's on Disney Plus in foreign territories that don't really? have HBO. Yeah, which is kind of interesting. It's fun that it's very depressing and scary movie is on Disney Plus. <laughs> And Kyle, you reminded me that you have stuff to plug as well, unrelated to screenwriting. Yeah, if there's any middle school band directors <laughs> watching this channel, uh, I do write music for GPG Music. And just look for uh, Kyle Sims under their new pieces. And how do they find that? What's the website? Uh, just gpg.com. I'll check it. Make sure I said that correctly. <laughs> That'd be a, the worst plug ever. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bunch of letters dot com and you said it wrong and they yeah. spell way people <laughs> they can't figure it out. <laughs> Let us know what you want to see next. Actually, we'll call this a review. How do you review Luke? I give him two thumbs <laughs> I give, up. Yeah. Two thumbs up. Four thumbs up. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't You're know. in the middle. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Five minutes. <minute. laughs> we'll see. Will Luke again. <laughs> we'll, we'll hopefully have you down again and do some more videos. And maybe we'll make that long-awaited sequel. <laughs> to a movie that no longer exists. Yes. Thank you so much. Like, share, comment, subscribe, all those things YouTubers say. And we will see you very soon. Hey.